Welcome back guys. In the last episode, we built three of our engine mounts for the Ferrari. We got the engine hung in it. K-Series is officially mounted. And I mentioned that there are two more engine mounts to build, one of which has to wait until I have my dry sump pump and pan. And that's because I don't want to build something that's going to interfere with those parts that I have to completely redesign and rebuild later. That doesn't make any sense. However, we're going to build the other one today. And I want to show you guys the whole process, starting with designing the part in CAD and show you how we're going to take a part drawn on the computer and bring it to life in steel. Because I think you guys might learn something from it. And I want to show you something I have found to be one of the most valuable tools and skill sets I have developed. I want to dispel this idea that drawing car parts in CAD means that you need kind of expensive tooling or a CNC mill or something like that to bring it to life, because that's not the case at all. I use CAD to draw all sorts of sheet metal parts, small odds and ends, nick sacks, bits and pieces. It's a really helpful tool that has made me a better fabricator, it has made me able to build stuff a lot quicker, and it has just increased my overall skill set. And I think it's something at least somebody out there will benefit from. So we're gonna start beginning to end but before we hop on the computer and build this part, I'm gonna show you guys what we need to do on the car. I touched upon this in the last episode, but what it is we're after here is there's a mount that hangs off of the transmission itself. It's part of the bell housing, and this is a factory mount from Honda. We wanna build an arm that goes from this 14 millimeter hole down to the chassis member that we welded down here, and that's why I put this chassis piece here instead of the previous one that was several inches up and further back. In essence, we want to build a bracket from this tube here that will hold our bushing and a short arm that will then come up and grab the transmission ear, which will help stabilize the engine and keep it from rocking. All right, let's go draw this part up on the computer. And for those of you that don't want anything to do with CAD or just don't care about this part, that's okay. You can go on and skip ahead. I have put different chapters in the timeline down below. You can see exactly where we're at in the process on the timeline of the video. Feel free to skip ahead, no problem at all. Now, I am gonna preface this part of the video by saying this isn't going to be an all-inclusive instructional how-to on CAD design. If that's a video that you guys want, leave me a comment and let me know, and I can definitely put together a full-on video of how to do CAD work, but that's a video in and of itself. This is gonna basically just kind of outline some of the basics of what we're here to do, which, as you guys can see, I've gone on and drawn up our bushing with some accurate measurements, and accuracy is really important here because all of this needs to be to scale for this to work. Following the bushing, I'm drawing a bushing mount housing, which you can see here. And this is a really simple part to make. It's using the sheet metal tool. And I'm gonna go on and draw the cope on the bottom, which is gonna be used to attach to our tube. Following that, I'm drawing the motor mount arm, and the dimensions are based off some dimensions that I pulled from the car itself. It's one and three sixteenths inch wide, six inches long, and has a 14 millimeter hole in the end. It's a pretty simple part and only takes a few minutes to draw up. And here you can see the finished assembly that we're gonna try and make today. This is pretty rudimentary. It's not a complicated CAD drawing. It only took me probably 10 or so minutes to draw up. And the real benefit at hand is that we can take this drawing and flatten these parts out. And that's gonna give us a template for how to make them in sheet metal, as you can see here. Now we can take this, what's called flat pattern, and get a technical drawing of it in Fusion 360, which is the software that I use. You can see here it has the bend lines, which are the dotted lines, and we can even see things like dimensions, hole sizes, and radius of copes. It's a really powerful tool, and we can print this drawing out at a one-to-one -one scale on printer paper and glue it to sheet metal, which is how we can make some really accurate parts really easily. And here's the actual printed diagram of our two parts. So we're gonna cut this stuff out and then I'm gonna go on and glue it down to the sheet metal. And honestly, Elmer's glue sticks are the best way I've found to do this. I have tried stick down labels in the past to make this a bit more streamlined, but it always leaves paper residue behind like a sticker that can't come off when you're done. This peels off every time and usually it doesn't peel up while you're working with it, but I'll show you guys some kind of easy tips a little bit later just in case that does happen.
after cutting the part out, my next step is always to go in and cut the corners off to save me a little bit of time on the belt sander later. For our hole drilling portion of this, we're gonna need a center punch and drill and drill bits. And if you don't have one of these auto center punches, you can just use a standard punch or honestly even a nail and a hammer. Just make sure you get your marks lined up so that your holes line up or the part isn't gonna work. I like to get these holes marked before I do anything else in case my paper does come off or does shift. It will ruin the part and that's no good. With some pilot holes drilled, I know that I can come back later and finish the drilling portion of this. And the next step, just in case the paper moves, as you can see it's lifting a little bit, is to mark the bend lines on the edges of the sheet metal, just in case it comes up. I wanna make sure that I can return to this piece and bend it if I lose my template. I decided here that I would go on and cut out these lower copes that will connect to the bushing housing. And I didn't completely finish the job as you can see here. I started having the paper lift on the corner and figured it would be smart to go on and bend this up now instead of risking having my paper lift. Now I know not everybody has a giant sheet metal break but there are other ways to bend sheet metal. You can use a vise and a hammer or kind of make a makeshift one on the edge of a workbench. But if you can't do either of those, honestly, you can draw this part in three pieces and weld it together. And I thought about doing it that way if this wasn't going to fit in my break, but thankfully it does. Now for the tool nerds out there that are curious, this is a late 1920s Dreisen Krumpf sheet metal break. It's eight feet long, it weighs well over 1,500 pounds, and when it was new, it was $450. And if you adjust for inflation, that's well over $7,000 today. I got it at a estate auction for 250 bucks. With our folded part, we're just gonna clean it up a little bit, check fitment with our bushing housing, and make sure it's all ready to go. And then we'll head on over to the belt sander and do some final cleanup on the outer edges. As mentioned before, let the belt sander do the work on this stuff. Now we need to go on and put our holes in each side. And I cut this a little bit short because this camera angle totally sucks. But we've got them sized out and then we need to clean up the kind of sheet metal flashing on the inside, which I'm gonna use the power file to do. About here is where I did my first test fit of the part, and I would show you that video except for I clicked record off instead of record on, and so all I have is a camera shot of me walking away from it. But here's a freeze frame that I did grab, and it fit really well. I built it just a smidge wide, and there is a thrust washer on each side of the transmission itself so that this can pivot without wearing away at it. With that part kind of close to done, it's time to repeat the entire process again for our bushing mount. I'll give you guys a time lapse of the process, but you know the drill. So I'm 
having to hold the camera with one hand here while we test fit so I can show you guys what we're working with. But we've got really good gaps on each side. It fits the tubes really well. Our cope here is really nice. And hopefully you guys can see that. There you go. So everything fits real well. We can weld the bottom of it. The only snag at the moment is, is we are not perfectly up and down on this bracket. So we're gonna shorten this one just a touch. Just kind of pull those copes on each side of this in and we should be in business. I think it'll fit. Now, while I have this thing off, I'm gonna add some holes to the top of it. I think it'll make the part look a little bit better. That probably would have been smarter for me to think of this morning when I drew the part in CAD, because I could have put that as part of the template and had everything like perfect, make this way easier. But I think, uh, I think it's worth doing. With that said, I don't know that I'm gonna keep this part. This is going to work for the time being, but if I have my way with this thing, I'm gonna redraw this thing in CAD again as a billet aluminum arm and have a buddy of mine machine it. But I'm gonna worry about that later. I don't know that that's gonna happen. Either way, I need something there. Let's throw some holes in this thing. We'll clean it up one more time and then we'll weld it. After some measuring, I decided on one and a quarter inch spacing with three quarters of an inch from each end for my holes. This gave me five equidistant holes that were also equally spaced from the ends of the part. Now, after drilling these out, you'll see me using a chamfering bit, and I'm using this just to kind of decorate the holes a little bit, make them a little bit visually interesting. The bit that I chose to use isn't quite the right one for this job, so I may go back and clean these up a bit more later, but overall, it came out looking pretty good. I then DA'd the part and used Scotch-Brite to clean it up. I mentioned in the last episode that I'm really starting to enjoy this TIG welding process and I found myself looking forward to this part most of all throughout the day. And it came out reasonably well, it's not perfect, but I'm happy with my progress as a TIG welder. And with everything assembled, it's finally time to put it on the car. And thankfully, everything still fit and fit well at that. call this episode done. That's a finished bracket, including filming. It only took a couple hours to make, which is pretty nice. And I think Warren's kind of using some of this CAD stuff for you guys. I hope you enjoyed the process and the video. Some of you guys said you really wanted to see more step-by-step -step and in-depth stuff. And this was an attempt at that. So leave me some feedback. Let me know if you liked what you saw. If you aren't subscribed yet and you like this stuff, please do subscribe. It helps this channel grow, helps me make this stuff worthwhile. And I will catch you guys next week. Now that I'm done with this, I'm gonna pull the engine back out and get started mocking up some fuel cell stuff. And we will, uh, we'll see how far we get with that on Tuesday. I'll catch you then, guys.